A reading from Deuteronomy chapter 4. Ask now of the days that are past, which were before you since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether such a great thing as this has ever happened or was ever heard of. Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of the fire and as you have heard and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders and by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all of which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. Out of heaven he let you hear his voice that he might discipline you, and on earth he let you see his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them, and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than yourselves, to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day, know therefore today, and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. Therefore you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for all time. This is the word of the Lord. It's a delight to be here to share with you the gospel according to Moses. I know some of you, the first question to arise in your minds will be, what gospel? For some, the only... A reading from Deuteronomy chapter 4. Ask now of the days that are past, which were before you since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether such a great thing as this has ever happened or was ever heard of. Did any people ever hear the voice of a God speaking out of the midst of the fire and as you have heard and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders and by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great deeds of terror, all of which the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. Out of heaven he let you hear his voice that he might discipline you, and on earth he let you see his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them, and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than yourselves, to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Know therefore today, and lay it to your heart, that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath, there is no other. Therefore you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for all time. This is the word of the Lord. It's a delight to be here to share with you the gospel according to Moses. I know some of you, the first question to arise in your minds will be, what gospel? For some, the only disease worse than Leviticus is Deuteronomy. And that's how we feel about this book. Since Luther and even before, we have had this negative view of this book, which presents a contrast to the gospel rather than the message of the gospel. If we, well, of course, we are not helped by the book itself in our English translations. It's called Deuteronomy which comes from the Greek meaning second law. That doesn't help us. But if we read the book for the first time out loud without the deficit of a history of interpretation, 
we would be more open, actually, to seeing the gospel. We would realize that this book is not just, it, or that this book is not cast primarily as law, but it is cast as sermon. These are Moses' final sermons, his valedictory addresses to his congregation before he passes on and before they cross the Jordan and enter the promised land. It is actually full of gospel. And if you would live uh, with Moses for 10, 12 years as I have, you begin to see the gospel on every page. I could actually flip uh, my way through here and randomly pick any text and I could see gospel there. That's what's happened to me in, my, in the course of my reading this text. Of course, the gospel is already found in the most familiar text in this book, namely the Decalogue, which is repeated here, coming after Exodus chapter 20. The Decalogue begins with gospel. I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. If that isn't gospel, I don't know what is. And in this book, gospel always precedes law. And we need to see it that way here. Actually, there are lots of texts that I debated talking about this morning. Uh, for instance, we could go to chapter 6, the end of this, which, which is what some people call the domestic catechism or a household catechism. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, what do the stipulations and statutes and judgments mean that the Lord has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us up from Egypt with a mighty hand. Oh, but I wasn't asking about that. I was asking about the law. What is the meaning of the law? Shh, I'll get there. Just hold on. We were slaves to Pharaoh. He brought us out of Egypt. Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his land. Come on, Dad, come on, Dad. I want to know about the law. I'll get there. And he brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give us the land that he swore to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes. Oh, finally, you're there. All these statutes to fear the Lord are our God, for our good always and for our survival as it is today. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe this whole command before the Lord our God, just as he commanded us. Here, Moses instructs parents as you respond to the questions of your children over the supper table, why do we live in this world? He instructs them on how to respond. If they ask about the laws, don't talk about the laws first because they come after. Reminds me of an episode in our own home when, when our son was in high school, he was a swimmer and all his best buddies were swimmers. And of course, when you work so closely with other uh, folks, there are often conflicts that happen in values. And I'll never forget one uh, evening at the supper table uh, in the midst of a warm conversation. He just blurted out, why do we have to live in such a prehistoric family? No, we could have said, oh, because this is the way we have to do it. This is what the church says. This is what my parents taught me. But no, it gave a wonderful opportunity for the why and it's not about the prehistoricness of the business, the antiquity of, of the regulations by which we live, but it's about how we got here. It is our response to gospel. That's a fabulous text. Or we could go to the end of the book, chapter 26, which is what von Rad calls the little credo, das kleine credo. This is actually another fabulous text, and it's well worth our reading uh, the whole thing. After all, as you know, the scriptures weren't written to be preached. They were written to be heard. So hear the word of the Lord. 
It shall be when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you as your grant and you possess it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground which you shall bring in from the land that the Lord your God gives you. You shall put it in a basket, go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at the time and say to him, I declare this day to the Lord my God that I have entered the land which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall answer and say before the Lord your God. And here it is. My father was a wandering Aramean. He went down to Egypt, sojourned there a few in number, but there he became a great, mighty, and populous nation. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and great terror and with signs and wonders. And he brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now look, I have brought the first of the produce of the ground which you, O Lord, have given me, and you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before him. You and the Levite and the alien who is among you shall celebrate in all the good which the Lord your God has given you in all your household. That's an interesting episode here. The, the person brings the first fruit of his harvest and to the Lord. And uh, if this were an ordinary fertility religion, it would be simply all about the first fruits. And so we give thanks for the first fruits. But of course, the person isn't interested only in the first fruits. It's not just about health, wealth, and good times. He uses this as an occasion to celebrate how we got here. Everything we are and have is the result of gospel. God in his mercy and in his grace has delivered us from the Egyptians, has brought us to this place, and now this fruit that I am bringing to the Lord is concrete evidence of the Lord's goodness and mercy in our lives. That's another fabulous text that we could go to, but I would like to go back to chapter 4, which was read so well for us by Clayton. This is the climax, the conclusion to Moses' first address. Up to this point in chapters 1, 2, and 3, he has been reviewing how we got here, Israel's experience of the grace of God since they left Sinai. Then in chapter 4, he backs it up a stage. In fact, he discusses three events at si or three events that preceded the journey from Sinai. He's actually telling the history of Israel backwards at this point. He begins with uh, a description. Really, it is a, 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 an ode to the grace of law, verses 1 to 8. Then he gives a longer discussion of the grace of covenant, verses 9 to 31, and then he climaxes in the grace and the wonder of salvation. I don't know why Moses uh, arranges the events in this order. They actually happened in the reverse order. They came out of Egypt first, then the Lord entered into covenant relationship with them, and then he revealed to them all the statutes and ordinances, whatever. But he's telling the story backwards here. My hunch is that he is doing this so that when the people go home for night after this long address, the song that will be ringing in their ears is the song of salvation. And that's why he ends here. So let's look at this. Actually, this text is organized very, very uh, deliberately. It's dominated by a refrain that shows up twice, verses 35 and 39. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides Him. Know therefore today, verse 39, lay it to heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath there is no other. But beyond that, the text is dominated by three questions. Verse 32, ask, well, actually three imperatives. Ask, verse 32, 
verse 35 and 39, no, and then verse 40, keep. These three questions reflect three lessons that Moses would want his audience to remember. The first is a history lesson, the second is a theology lesson, and the third is the practical lesson, the so what. Ask now. Let's look briefly at this history lesson. And it's appropriate that here in this academic uh, context we comment on verse 32 because uh, notice how he frames it. Ask now concerning the former days which were before you since the day that God created man on the earth, inquire from one end of the heavens to the other, has anything like this ever been told before? Notice he is inviting his hearers to do exhaustive doctoral dissertation research. Ask from one end of the heavens to the other, which means go and check every library in the world of your time. But of course, he's also asking you to go be to the ancient libraries since man was created on the earth. Go check Ashurbanipal's library or the ancient library of Alexandria or any other libraries. See if anything like this has ever happened. Anything like what? Well, then he sets the agenda. Four questions. One. Has any great event like this happened before? He doesn't talk about what that event is yet, what he might have in mind, but this great event, is there any precedent? Two, has anybody ever heard about this, anything like this? Now, the first question, I think, has to do with history. In the history of humankind, is there any comparable event to what he is about to describe? Read all the history books, see if you can find something. In the second question, I think he's going beyond history. He's now going into legends and myths and fairy tales, the world of imagination. Has anybody ever imagined something like this? Go look at all the books, the Dr. Zeus books and whatever else you have. Third question. Now he gets more specific. Has anybody, any people ever heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire and survived? Well, there are two problems here. One, if you would hear the voice of God, you wouldn't live to tell it. It would be lethal, deadly. But the other side of it is, have they survived? The question really uh, is about survival of such an encounter with God. And then the fourth question has any God ever dared to do what Israel's God has done? And in this third question, the focus, or in the th uh, third question, the focus had been on the people, but now he shifts the focus to God. Is God, is there any God like this who has done for a people what Israel's God has done for them? And of course, the answer to all of these questions is negative. No great event like this has ever happened. No one has ever imagined a story like this. No people has ever heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire and lived. And no God has ever dared to invade another God's territory, snatch a little people for himself, and take them as his covenant people. Doesn't happen. They leave well enough alone. And and, but that's what Israel has done. This is precisely, he personally invaded the land of Egypt, the mightiest nation on earth, snatched Israel from its clutches, and brought this people to himself. But why did he do it? Look at verse 37. Because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them, and he personally brought you out from Egypt. The love of God is the gospel here. God's unbelievable covenant commitment to the ancestors, which is what drives him to rescue their, uh, their descendants. So this is the history lesson. Has any gospel ever like this, like this ever been imagined?
And the answer is never in the history. The history lesson. So what? This leads us then to the theology lesson. Twice he says, know therefore that Yahweh is God. There is no other. Know therefore that Yahweh is, is God. There is no other. Twice he says it. Out of these historical events arises this amazing theology. All of this has had a revelatory significance. In actual fact, God didn't get Israel out of Egypt just to get Israel out of Egypt. He got Israel out of Egypt that the world may know that He is God, that Pharaoh may know that He is God, and that the Egyptians may know that He is God, and guess what? That we may know that He is God. That's the theology lesson that derives from the history, and it ends then with a practical lesson. Now that you know the story, now that you know that this God, creator of heaven and earth, the only God who is, has personally rescued you, in the words of Francis Schaeffer, how then should we live? And the answer is, so keep his statutes, his commandments, which I am giving you, that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may live long in the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. Even in the instructions and the commands and the ordinances, there is gospel. There's gospel at every level here. Gospel in redemption, gospel in revelation, and gospel in the knowledge of the will of God. And it's not just that God is an ogre wanting His people to live this way because He said so, but it is in their best interest and in the interests of the spreading of the gospel to all nations. This is a fabulous gospel that we find in the book of Deuteronomy. But by now some of you are, no doubt, bored out of your minds by these ancient history and theoretical theology lessons. If that's the case, we, and not Israel, are the ones to be pitied. Few texts in all of Scripture are more profound and more exhilarating than these verses. They should be as inspiring to the Christian reader today as they were for the original hearers, not only for their vibrant style, but for their profound theology. This text tells us that God's salvation is achieved at tremendous expenditure of divine energy. We didn't read the, or highlight the seven expressions with signs, wonders, daring acts, a strong hand, a mighty arm, war, and all of this. He doesn't underestimate the strength of the enemy. And of course, so it is with us. If it took that kind of divine energy to get Israel out of Egypt, what he did for this nation of slaves is paradigmatic for what he does for us. Enslaved not to an evil earthly empire, but to sin. In fact, in the death and resurrection of Christ, we witness a surpassing demonstration of power, the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. That's actually Exodus language in Romans 1, 16 to 17. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus proves that he is God, his identity with God, and he demonstrates the power to rescue us. This text gives us profound theology, profound history, but I'd like to close by giving you a Christian paraphrase of this. There's much more we could say and should say about it, but here is a Christian paraphrase. For ask now of the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether such a great thing has ever happened or was ever heard of. Did any people ever encounter their gods directly as you have encountered him and still live? Or has any god ever dared to invade the kingdom of darkness and take a people for himself from the midst of that kingdom by trials and signs and wonders and war, by mighty hand and an outstretched arm, 
and by great deeds of terror, all of which Jesus Christ, your God, has done for you on the cross before your eyes. To you it was shown that you might know that Jesus Christ the Lord is God. There is no other besides Him. Out of the heaven He came as the divine Word that He might reveal the Father to you. And on earth He revealed His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And because He loved the ancestors and chose their spiritual offspring after them, He brought you out of the kingdom of darkness by His great power, disarming the rulers and authorities and putting them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him in order to grant us an inheritance since we have been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. Know therefore today, lay it to your heart, that Jesus Christ the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath there is no other. And therefore, walk in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy and giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. Praise be to God.